Good evening, guys, and welcome to Classic Car Restoration Club Live Q&A. So this is our opportunity for you to, like, bounce your questions off us. And But I always consider this kind of like a back-and-forth forum. So if, you know, we get a question, we'd love to be the uh, know the answer to all all questions. But we are, we don't have that ability. So... Uh, so if we run into one, you know, we may kick it back out to you guys and hopefully, you know, somebody in our community has the solution okay. we're looking for, you know, it's, uh, so that's what I like about this event. We have the opportunity to do a little back and forth and like, and if you have any questions, don't go to that little chat button in the corner and talk to member services. If you have a question with your membership or dues or whatever, um, but in the big chat box right below this window, there's a chat box where you can type your questions in there and, uh, and you can look there to, you know, see what other people have to say as well. Um, in addition, if you look just below this box, there's a little, uh, a little window there for, uh, a 66, uh, tips, uh, and that is a, it's sort of a, you know, restoration tips uh, PDF I put together. Or some, you know, just some handy tips that you can use to restore your car. You know, and even if you just get a handful of tips out of there, it's, it's you know, it's a great thing to, you know, read. Plus, you know, it doesn't cost you anything. So go ahead and go down below there. You can download that at any time. Uh, also, recently we had a virtual car show, and uh, in our virtual car show, we had we picked four winners of some great uh, uh, wizards. Uh, the, the wizards was good with backing us up with supplying us a nice what they call their cool kit, which is uh, some great detailing products and car cleaning cleaning detailing product in a nice like little soft side cooler so you can also use the cooler to store the cleaning products if you're in your show car or you know you can take all that stuff out and use the cooler to keep your beverages uh for the cruise night you know not that we'd ever take beverages no, with no. us <laughs> but in in our virtual car show we selected four winners you know we had a we had a pre-war car a post-war car uh you know a uh, Gary and mine's favorite pick. And then we also had a People's Choice Award. So, you know, the winners, George Wellborn, Roger, and I'll mess it up. My apologies, Aquaspace, uh, Regis Bondar, and Stan Gordon were our winners. If you're one of these four people, please keep your, you know, look in your email box. You're going to be getting an email from sweepstakes at tnmarketing.com. And basically, they're just looking for your mailing address so we can mail out that product to you guys. So congratulations to our winners. And uh, also make sure you check your junk mail and everything else. So just in case, you know, we want to make sure that the people that won, the, won these great products get them so keep an eye out if you're if you're one of these four people if you even know one of these four people make sure you let them know that there's an email coming asking for their contact information um did you get another that? no I, no i had no idea i i'm afraid you guys weren't qualified oh. you know, it it looked pretty bad if you guys won that's true you know, they'd be like, geez, who do you think you are letting them guys win? And then they think it was rigged. And even though, you know, Terry and you both won at the last oh, show, you. both brought home <laughs> trophies. All three of us. Don't leave yeah. yourself out. And and there was like, you know, a couple hundred cars there at least. And, uh, you know, so we, thanks to a great show. And, you know, we all took home trophies, took home some of the hardware. It was uh, so that was kind of uh, surprising. But very, I think I invite a lot of friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whenever you go to a car show, invite all your, all your friends. friends. Yeah. <laughs> And a very loud exhaust, apparently. 
<laughs> Ross has a trick. Yeah. Yeah. Ross, Ross, <laughs> Ross's, Ross's technique at a car show, he's that guy, you know, that annoying guy that starts his really loud car yeah. every 15 minutes and Once then it's like, oh, geez, he started it. And I got another vote. <laughs> You can see the crowd wandering towards your car when you do that too. Yep, every time he starts his car, a big crowd yeah. wanders over there to look at what's making all that noise. Yeah, yeah. so I do that once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, guys, we're we're thankful for everybody coming out tonight. So let's get started. We've got a few people that have asked questions. If you got a question, now's the time to get it in so we can get them all lined up and we get time to answer it. Uh, also, we're going to be talking a little bit time to time uh, when we get a little pause in the questions. We're going to talk about getting your car ready for winter. And I know you guys in Phoenix are just getting your cars out to start enjoying them for the season. But us people here in the Northland, you know, the, usually after Labor Day, you know, September gets really busy with car shows. And by the time you get into October, it all kind of goes away. People start putting their cars away for the season. And, You're switching. Yeah. And so we'll talk a little bit about that from time to time tonight. So we'll share. And if you guys got any ideas as we share some of our car storage ideas, feel free to type those in the comment section as well. So let's get started. Tony Hinman from, writes, Hi, Mark. I'm restoring a 1960 Catalina. And I'm considering converting from original generator to an alternator. Will I have to disconnect the original amp meter in the dash, or is there something I can do to keep using it? I've seen some articles that say the amp meter will burn up if used with an alternator. Uh, I don't agree with that assessment. Um, I don't think so. I, I why it's, why it's would it? Measuring it. Yeah, it's all the all the amp. You know, it's a, they're both twelve volt cars. Yeah. Uh, the difference between a generator and alternator, you know, there are differences between a generator and alternator. A uh, generator will yeah. charge a dead battery, an alternator will not charge a dead battery. A uh, a generator does not is not efficient, so it does not create enough voltage at idle. Uh, so they will eventually wear it on the battery at idle. Um, but they're both, you know, in, in a 1960 Catalina, that's a 12 volt car. So yeah. it's creating 12 volts. Same as, you know, it's just measuring all the amp meter is going to do is measure the direction of current, either be charge or discharge. And actually, a lot, you know, whether it has two terminals and it's hooked to the gauge or, you know, a lot of cars in this era, the amp meter is just simply a, a loop that the wire. You know, going from the, the amp meter or the from the generator to the battery is just a loop where it's measuring the direction of the current. I know on the car behind us, that's all that is. It's just a, the wire passes through a metal loop. There's no insulation off of it or anything, and it measures the direction of current. And it does a really good job of it. So it. Um, and, and I think you can get a multimeter that works that way, yeah. you know, where you just clamp it around the wire and it's reading the I don't think the GM had that back then. But yeah. Well, a lot, a lot of them use the two meters. terminals. Yeah. I think Mopar went with the loop. Yeah. I know well, I know my, my John Deere lawnmower goes with just a loop. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, it, it to the idea that it's going to burn out your amp meter, it, it, that makes no sense to me. Oh. Uh, to me personally, I've never experienced an issue with the amp meter changing from, you know, I've never, and actually on most 12 volt cars where you've converted from, where I've converted from an uh, alternator to a generator or even converted from uh, external voltage regulator to an internal right. one wire, you know, I've never had any issues on any of them with uh, the original gauges having issues unless of course it's six volt to 12 volt then yeah. that's a diff yeah. little bit different story you got to watch some of the gauges on that i agree the uh, uh let's see jasper writes hi mark thanks for taking the time to help us yeah you're well you're welcome it's my pleasure I, I own a 1963 Nova SS. I have had it 42 years and wow. upgraded it years ago to the 64 to 67 
brakes, Nova brakes, four wheel drum, single pod master cylinder, non power. Holy smoke. Hey. <laughs> I am having a hard time stopping lately. The best way to describe it is like having it's it's like power brakes with a bad booster. The pedal effort is ridiculous. Hard pedal. Uh, I have to remove I have to remove the wheels yet. I have not removed the wheels yet. What do you what do you think is causing this? I did a quick bleed to be sure I was getting the fluid to all wheels. Uh, I am possibly, I was thinking, he, he continued further down, I was thinking glaze, he, he probably ran out of the character space. Uh, I was thinking glaze breaks, they're old, 15 plus years, but look, they look good. Any help is much appreciated. That kind of thing. That's yeah, it, 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 it may be, it may be the glaze break. I, you know, also if it's been, um, the, the other, my other concern would be if, you know, like it, on a show car where it's just sitting most of the time that the, you know, that in the wheel cylinders themselves, that the, uh, that those, uh, pissed and start they get stuck in That's there true. so they're not moving freely true. Um, the you know you would still get fluid out of, if you bled them but they but the pistons themselves might not be right. moving as freely That's as true. they should there's not a lot to a you know without a, without a, with a single a single reservoir. There's no metering valve or anything like that because everything just goes to a splitter block. Um, so there's not a lot of components to the system. There's a master cylinder, you know, and the, the wheel cylinders. And if you're really getting hard braking, I would I would be tempted. My first gut would for me I would be tempted to replace my wheel cylinder. I agree because um, you know he does say they're fifteen plus years old. Yeah, so. and and brake fluid, brake fluid. You know, if you, uh, ideally you're changing a brake fluid annually. I don't know anybody that does that. Uh, the brake manufacturers or the brake fluid manufacturers recommend annually draining your, your entire brake system and replacing all your brake fluid because the system will absorb moisture even out of the air and. Uh, Especially but, if they're not moving as much. You're not using but if, much. if if there's any moisture in the system at all, just sitting for you know you know yeah, around here right. for six months out of the year, uh, then the things have a way of corrode. You know the moisture in the brake fluid has a way of corroding the insides of things and making things stick, especially out at the wheel cylinder. That's a good point. It's not that expensive either, especially if it's a nice car. You can usually just replace all those cylinders for reasonable price. Yeah, yeah they're, they're not that bad. Yeah, yeah. Wheel cylinders are usually, you know, under usually under twenty five dollars right. a piece. Right. Um, and uh, you know, so you, so if you can replace all your wheel cylinders on a on a Nova, which I imagine there's only four of them, it's not right. going to be a dual uh, cylinder car. So yeah, if if you're spending a hundred bucks to put all brand new wheel cylinders in the car, you probably probably I would guess that might do it for you. That would be my guess. You know, other things you might want to check is make sure all your pivot points on your brake pedal and all that stuff is lubricated and moving freely. And but odds are, if you're pumping the brakes to bleed it, you're, you'd feel it if there was anything else in the system that was. Uh, causing that but that would be my guess off the bat because your system is really basic yeah um and without uh, you know without any with with a, it's about one of the few components you know you might want to check your pivot points and make sure on your backing plates all your you know all those are clean because those can rust up too and just sitting all the time so yeah, you know, yeah. Do a good inspection. Consider replacing all of your wheel cylinders. Would be my bet. 
I would think Rock Auto actually carries those now. Yeah, I would get, you know, oh, yeah. I'm always surprised that, you know, yeah. uh, you go to Rock Auto and it's like, yeah, you know, what was it? The one time we, we came across there, it was like, I needed a, a power steering pump yeah. for a 57 DeSoto and I needed it like in two weeks and none of the rebuilders could have one back to me in like a month and a half. And it was like, I call, you know, and then it's like Rock Auto. It's like, what? They have one? <laughs> And and in, and in four days, yeah, the core was the core was horrible. <laughs> they wanted it back, but you know they were they were quick about sending back my corn charts too. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, it was it was a, a lifesaver at that point. Okay, James writes. Uh, a few sessions ago, I asked if anyone used Duracool as a replacement for R12 Freon um, on a classic car. Well, I tried it. I have a 73 Chevy Caprice hardtop coupe Resto mod with OEM AC. I flushed the system, replaced the expansion valve, and receiver dryer and all O-rings replaced the compressor with 11 ounces of OEM mineral oil, uh, evacuated the system, and recharged with Duracool 12A. I used 40% of what was recommended for R12. After charging, I ran it for about an hour within the first two... Oh no, he ran out of characters. First two what? First two uh, to finish. The, oh no. Okay. Yeah, Within the first two, and then he comes back later to oh. finish. The duct temp was thirty-eight degrees. This stuff works great. Wow. Oh, um, nice. I have ne I have never tried. Uh, I I I'm impressed. I'm impressed that it's working that well. Um, 38 degree duct, uh, duct temperature. Holy smoke. Yeah, you could, you could hang beef in there. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, I have not used it, but you know, James, uh, you know, thanks guys. If you're, you know, some of your, you know, you know, I think I remember him the okay. first time around yeah. and, yeah, he said, "Let us know how it works out." Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. No, I no, I think it's cool. If you look at you know, if you try to find R twelve Freon around huh. anywhere, it's like you know, it's getting a little easier to find because you know most people at this point have converted to one thirty four or, or you know done something. I still um, have a twenty pounder. You still have a twenty pounder? <laughs> yeah. Well, there goes your your retirement yep, account. It's gone already. <laughs> I should have sold it a long time ago. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think that that's cool, James. Thanks for your thanks for the update and thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And and thanks for the the extensive question. I appreciate it. Yeah. So you know, if you guys are you know, if you have any, as long as James is on the line, if you guys have any questions of making the conversion. He's kind of spelled out pretty much what he did, but you know, we all have. Uh, there's always a question that two that pops up, but thanks again, James, for sharing. That's awesome. Yeah, I wonder how, how available that stuff is. Uh, the Duracool? Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know. I'd have to. Um, I haven't done a search for it, but uh, if it's a new product out there, then it's, uh, it's probably available somewhere. Fred Wright. I've been working on the interior of my 69 AMX. Rebuilt the heater box and fan. I'm about ready to start it up, but I need to to drain and refill the radiator. Any tips on getting it completely filled? And what happens if there's air in the system? Um, I'm not aware of you know. Uh, well, a 69 AMX would be a what 390 car or yeah. three. Um, I'm sure I'm going to mess that up. Somebody's going to like go, Mark, you fool. Um, if it is a 69, I would think it'd be 390. The, I'm, uh, and I'm about to drain, I'm not aware of there being any unique issues with the, with the 69 AMX. If somebody knows differently, 
uh, you know, the, usually the biggest issues are, you know, getting air out of the system, uh, you know, usually involve, you know, making sure your heater's on full, so you're circulating air not only through your heater box, your heater core, but also through the entire engine. Uh, I know some guys that have, you know, uh, when they're filling, they want to open up, you know, they usually there's a few frost plugs or plugs in the, in the top of the intake manifold, sometimes they like to open those up so and as soon as they get fluid up that level sealing and closing those up but uh, i'm not aware of i'm i'm personally not aware of any issues with i don't think so either yeah, maybe uh um, leave your upper radiator hose off you know without the thermostat and fill it up so you get air out of that first and fill up the block yeah is that way you don't know, open out it's a lot easier okay um, uh, from, from, uh, looks like Facebook, Lynn, uh, oh, Lynn on YouTube. Yes. Where are you guys located? The virtual car show was cool. Maybe I can enter the next show. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we are located in, uh, in, in the great middle of the country in, uh, <laughs> the, we're in, uh, in the Minneapolis area. And uh, we uh, we do plan on doing another virtual car show in the future. Uh, watch, you know, uh, if you're if you haven't signed up for the email newsletter, it goes out with some of that. We have a regular email newsletter that you can sign up for somewhere on the uh, on the page. It'll be get more classic car related club. Usually, we'll we'll post it in there. Um, also on our Facebook page. So, so check those sites, you know, when we have the next one, we'll certainly, you know, uh, love to have you submit your car and participate. Uh, Neil writes, hi Mark, it's Jasper Neil. Jasper Neil car is definitely driven. The, oh, uh, it's me, Jasper. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. You're up on top here. Yeah, Jasper. Okay. The brakes. Uh, is driven weekly unless snow is on the road. I do have all the parts. Thanks for confirming my thought. I became disabled recently, uh, and I want to do it once and do it right. You guys are the best. RockAuto.com had all my my parts. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you know, yeah, they, they never cease to amaze me on what yeah. they carry, but, you know, thank, and, and at a reasonable price. I think that's what I like yeah, about awesome. them. You know, there's a lot of places you can probably order a lot of classic car parts, but it always surprises me when Rock Auto's got uh, the parts I need at a really good price. So it's like, you know, it's worth checking out. If, and a lot of times they'll give you like options on which yeah. parts you want. Drivers, you know, do you want the AC Delco one or do you want the Bosch one or do they want, you know, so they'll give you uh, choices and you can decide how much you want to spend. So it's a, it's a great resource, guys. And we're not being, you know, we don't get a dime from uh, Rock Auto, but, you know, hey, Rock Auto, if you want to give us a dime, we're here. <laughs> Service is free part too. Okay. <laughs> I've used service. them for years. So. You have to return something; it's it works great yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, that's that's another good thing. You know, it's like the it's, returns. You know, they they're good customer service. Good you know, customer. it's like it. I always said, you know, it uh, the the gauge of uh, a good uh, company to work with is not when everything goes right, not when you get your parts delivered and everything goes on. It's when things go wrong. It's like how eager are they to solve your problems and re, you know resolve the issues so everybody's happy. And you know I've never had an issue with Rock Auto. And My I'm, only complaint is I can't talk to anybody there. <laughs> well, you want know, you want to talk to people. Well, yeah, I mean, so they do have I'm a caller ID. Them. They know who's calling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they, all. <laughs> all right, guys. Mike, all right, I have a 1997 Chevy Suburban and the transmission is very suddenly stopped working. So the car does not move in any gear and gives a loud whirring sound. 
Do you think it is one of the solenoids <coughs> or a blockage in the fluid line and the fluid is not circulating? <coughs> I would say if it suddenly stopped working, suddenly stopped, you know, you know my first thought. How many miles it, for one yeah, thing? Well, yeah. I mean, obviously, they got a lot of miles. I've, I've seen torque converters, input shafts wear out. I've seen bands break. Lines. I've seen. But he has uh, nothing though, yeah. just like my Dodge Durango. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a good working transmission. So. And yeah, I I would. Uh, Pump shaft stripped off. It could yeah yeah and it's, that you know if you know yeah certainly you could you know you could take it into a shop a tranny shop and they're going to. Yeah, you know, be able to Drop run a pan. test on it, and the, but for the most part, I can tell you, most training shops are going to tell you you're going to have to have it rebuilt. Yeah, and, sure that's uh, what. It's and, a what? Yeah, ninety-seven four L sixty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it 4L60. could be anything. Could be that whole sun cage stuff that kind of <laughs> is notorious for exploding on those. But usually, you don't lose mm. your forward and mm -hmm. your reverse. You know, usually, I'd say it's either your torque and rear stripped off or your pump shaft for your tranny pump. So, yeah, I wish I wish we had a we had a, Neil. I wish we had like a great, uh, um, <laughs> uh, not Neil, but uh, Michael. I'm, I wish we had a uh, uh, rock child. Rec you know, that's the kind of thing where if it suddenly just stops working, it's going to take some more analysis. And usually, the places that you know, it's, it's a training shop is going to you know. I know you probably don't want to hear that, so it's either you take the tranny out and go get a salvage yard transmission, replace it, or you you take the transmission or the whole vehicle in somewhere and have them uh, check the transmission. Um, yeah, not a it's uh, not a silver bullet on that one. No, if it did that, it's probably not uh, bands or clutches or anything like that. So. Yeah. Uh, Jerry writes, hey guys, I have a 1986 Ford F-150. I'd like to repaint. The original paint is acrylic lacquer on an 86 Ford? Mm. That doesn't sound right. Um, or ask our paint expert here. Yeah, they're typically converted over by that point, but it's, I suppose it's possible. 150? In '86, one fifty. Uh, I, I find that hard. That's, that's by then they were moving to clear coats. Yeah. You know. Well, that was right in the transition for base coat clear coat. So it'd be kind of. I had especially eight, if it wasn't. Done. I had an eighty Ford Bronco that had clear coat on it because it came off in sheets. <laughs> yeah, you're typically moving from straight enamel to base coat clear coat in that time frame. So to have a factory lacquer. I would, maybe on something more commercial, heavy duty, where they didn't quite get to that point yet. But that's just a regular. That's a straight up one fifty, right? Yeah. So yeah. pretty common. Yeah. He, he writes. Not. He writes. Can I repaint without stripping all the paint off? Well, even if it was lacquer, couldn't you? You could repaint. Over it's either. Lacquer. I mean, it doesn't matter. It depends on what kind of shape the paint's in. So right. yeah. If it truly is lacquer, look really close at it and see if there's got little crack check marks in it. Because that's what lacquer did; it checked. Um, and if it's checked, you do have to take it off because that goes all the way down, and you're not going to hide it because you might get might cover it up for a little while, but it will come back because that paint's going to sit underneath there and keep moving, and it's going to uh, it's going to go up through the top. You're going to see it. It's not the top's not no matter what's on it. It's not going to keep that from showing up. Yep. So. Um, it doesn't matter if it's lacquer or not. If it's in good shape, you can. Yep. Um, if it just dull it, and a few scratches yeah. and road wear and stuff like that, sand it down. And Even if it wasn't it. lacquer, if it's all chalky, you want to get rid of the chalkiness, get down to some good paint and use that for a substrate. But if it is it your daily driver, is it something you just want to freshen up? Yeah, go for it. But if it's a, if it's a show piece, I get rid of it. Personally, I get rid of it. I go down to metal, start over. But if it's in good condition, yeah, there's no reason why you can't. You just got to prep it and upgrade it, right? And 
Um, take off anything that doesn't look good, feather it out, primary need to. Yeah, you can do it. Um, is it, we did it all the time. It didn't matter. We didn't remove the lacquer paint to repaint them. We painted, we just repainted them. Just got rid of the bad areas. Jerry, Jerry has another note here. He says the truck was built in Canada and the paint code calls for lacquer. Should I spray hmm. primer over it first? Thanks, Jerry. Um, not necessarily. You're going to need to primer um, your breakthroughs, feather edges, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I, for me, whenever, you know, like an old repaint, I used to always nail it with a full coat of like epoxy primer. Well, uh, at that point, what you're doing is you're creating a barrier coat. Yeah. Keep many solvents in front of top to get down or get down into it. Lacquer was uh, very good for absorbing and holding solvents. And where you'd see a lot of, where you did work, you'd see little rings and um, where the solvent would go in and work in and it would come out later and they would, those scratches would just sink. Sure. Yeah. So doing some sort of barrier coat is, that'll help a lot. But I'd say wherever you have any breakthroughs or work, you do want to, I would primer it because if you don't, those sand through, those feather edges are going to probably show up. Probably. probably. But if it's all in good shape and it's, you could just scuff it and shoot it. Yeah. But anywhere there's an edge, that's going to be a, a sponge soaking up solvent. Yeah. It'll hold it for a while and it will come out. And then when it does come out, everything's going to shrink and it's going to look terrible. Yeah. Nothing like, nothing's worse than, you know, you feather edged out some areas that you worked on and then you go, everything looks nice and you go to start painting and all of a sudden around all those edges, you start getting so, those mm -hmm. weird little marks where, you yep. know, it starts uh, doing stuff. Yep. And you just kind of go, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. But look at it. If you have those little check crack marks, and you may have to look close at it, um, get get that off because you're not going to hide that. Very good. Uh, Mike on Facebook asked, how hard is it to replace the spider gears on a 70 Impala with Pause attraction. And Paula could very well be a 12 volt uh, yeah. and a 70 full size with Posi. I don't think it's that big a deal. I mean, you got your, depends on what type of Posi it is, too, though. They have a couple different kinds. But uh, there's a couple of spring plates that you got to get in and pull those out first, you know, your pin. And, you know, it's pretty simple to do. I mean, I wouldn't. It just depends on, there's different types of posies. There's two different types. I forget what the other one in type involves, but once you get in there, you'll, you should be able to pull those spring plates off with the clutch pressure plates on them. That's the most common one. And then get that out of there and then pull your pin, your pinion, carrier pin, and you can just pull those straight out. Problem is getting them all lined up to get your axles back in. You know, it's kind of fun. You got to just play with them, but it's not that bad. <laughs> All right, you heard them. <laughs> if you want, uh, you know, and and we'll later on we'll post Ross's email address so you. Can... <laughs> <laughs> I've you done it before. It's not that bad. I had mine were just the spring loaded ones with the plates, uh -huh. um, and it's very simple, really. I mean, once you get in there, if you wrench on a rear end before, it's, you know. Yeah, you you're not you're not really messing with. A lot of tolerances and stuff at no. that point. Uh, no. It's not like setting like the the ring gear, the piston, right. or the pinion gears, or anything like that. You're just put all new bushings in behind them for sure. If you can replace the gears, yeah, you know, pushing brass bushings behind them, most of them. Cool. But yeah. All right, guys, come on. We'll get a few more questions here. And like we, and like I said, there's a right below here in the chat box. There's the uh, uh, the 66 tips um, uh, that you can download for free. All you got to do is enter, you know, uh, click on the box, enter your email address, and and you know, download that for free. Uh, it's a great little resource to have. Uh, again, if you were, you know, one of the winners of our virtual car show that we had a few days ago, 
uh, George Wellborn, Roger Aquis, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna always mess up your name, Aquista Pace, uh, Regis Bondar, or Stan Gordon. Look for that email, that sweepstakes, that TN marketing email coming in your box or just looking for your home address so they can ship that stuff off. Um, so if you don't see it in your regular email box, yeah, always check your junk or spam email just in case things end up there. Some people, everything they get ends up in their spam box. Sometimes I get stuff that I need in my spam email box even. I don't know why it just goes there. <laughs> the uh, and we were uh, again, guys. If you got some questions, we've got some others that were emailed in. But we were going to talk briefly about getting your car ready for winter. There is a follow up there. Oh, there is it. Oh, Cheers. so I uh, So it was your truck. So if it was your, your truck. truck what would you shoot it with? Would uh, would a 2K urethane be the proper paint or something else? 2K urethane, you got it. Yep, that's that's pretty standard now too. 2K urethane? Yep, yep. It's uh, almost everything's urethane now. Base coat and clear, so. What does the 2K stand for? Two components, catalyzed or hardened. Yeah, okay. yep, yep, two component. Okay. So yeah, um, yeah, without a doubt. Whether it's baseball clear coat or just a single stage, either way, they're both your thing. But yeah, absolutely, that's what I would do. Cool. Yep. And James also has a follow. Uh, just as a note, the Caprice Classic is uh, big enough to put in an entire cow in there. <laughs> or the AC to go. <laughs> so he is hanging meat in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, at 38 degrees out of the duck, of course you want to put it. We ain't gonna put your cow in there. So if you're from Montana, there is your <laughs> component to have. Just yeah. kidding, Montana. <laughs> the um, okay. First thing, my biggest tip for guys storing cars is if you're gonna leave, if it's not gonna be something, if it's, you're gonna put it somewhere where nobody's gonna see it, it's gonna be put away and nobody's gonna be in and out of it during the winter, is to put sun visor down. Uh, because the mice like to crawl up. They're lo always looking for a place to nest and you know, and they like to crawl up the A pillars or up the you know B pillars. And they get up, they you know, claw themselves around. They like they like the sun visors up because now it gives them a nice place to hang out and sit. Then as soon as they're sitting up there, they want to just start chewing through headliner. the headliner because they're looking for the next place to go. Mm. So they're so uh, my best tip, uh, one of my best tips I can give you if you're storing your car, you know, and you always got to worry about mice getting in your car, you know, yeah, you can do a lot of things to stop them from, but you don't want to stop them from getting in your car, but if you put your visors down, then they've got no place to sit there and then chew wood into your headliner, and then they make big nests in your headliner, start taking all your seat insulation and sticking it up in your... <laughs> your headliner and then they sit up there and sleep and do all that whatever mice do all winter long and next thing you know you've got you know a hard crunchy headliner covered with all kinds of stains and everything else so that's my first tip what do you do ross do you i store use like cars? four boxes of dryer sheets dryer sheets like the bounce dryer sheet my whole car is full of them really when I store it up at my lake place. Nice and stinky in there. So. Yeah, it smells pretty good when you get in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I put them under the hood, underneath the car, everywhere. But And that's up in a garage at your lake place, and it's not heated, right? Not so. heated. So it's up there. And, hoods, you know. up, hoods up or down? Or? The hood's been always been closed. Okay. I keep a maintainer on it. but I know some, some guys are adamant about you know, always make sure that you leave the hoods open because idea. because mice are looking for dark, enclosed places. So they like to okay. get under the hood, and because they you know, one of the you know one of the outer coatings they put on uh, plastic wire nowadays is soy based. So yeah. so the mice like to you know go after your electrical wires because they you know they, there's not a lot to eat in the middle of January. 
So what, you know, because it kind of tastes good to them, they'll eat it. And then they just chew the snot out of your wiring. And I know my daughter who just kind of lives, you know, up north and uh, uh, she just leaves her car out for a week and, you know, she can open the hood and find mouse nests under the hood. And so it's, you know, the, the kind of thing where a lot of people say, you know, avoid having like dark or hidden places, but you know, you can't do it for every place on your car, you know. It's like, I do put like four or five mouse traps in there as soon as I put the car in there too. In the, yeah, in the like garage. snap traps snap kind of thing? Traps. If there is any in there, they're gonna they're gonna get you know in the traps, and at yeah. least hopefully you won't get any more after that. But, but uh, yeah, garage up north, it seems like you can get in anywhere. Yeah, yeah. right. But, but. That's usually the case, you know. Is you, you can make something really tight, and it's still you'd be surprised where you know where mice can get into you know the spaces that they they can quickly get through. I know our, our our cabin up north is big. We got like, you know, you see them go through little like slivers of space and it's like, how does a mouse fit through that? You know, it's, like, it's incredible what they can do if they want. So, you know, if you think you're going to keep them out just by having a, a tight building, you would be surprised that what they can get into. Yeah. But yeah, another, another source is just to, you know, keep, you know, I know some guys like say, you know, poison, but you know, I know, uh, the big, my biggest fear with poison is, is a lot of it is it's like they make it so it's attractive for them to eat. Well, that brings them to it. You know, it, to me, it's like, if you're going to use poisons or things like that, you know, don't put them next to the car, put them away from the car to keep them, not to entice them to go in or uh, around the car rather than just keep them out of the building itself. Um, or they eat the poison and they crawl in your car and die and you can't yeah. get to it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, so, you know, I know thing, I know some guys like talk like Irish spring soap, but you know, I had, you know, we had done a thing on, 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 uh, keeping mice out of your car, one of the suggestions was Irish spring soap and we had a bar of it sitting on the on the counter in here in the shop and all of a sudden, you know, I come out like you know, a couple of weeks later and half the bar is eaten. And it's like, wait a minute, so this is supposed to keep them away yet they ate half of the bar. <laughs> so so I don't think, you know, things like Irish Spring, I'm, I'm not a big advocate of it, although I still know people that swear by it. So I, you know, ultimately, I think one of those, you know, it's keeping, keeping rodents out is like uh, a big issue when storing anything. But it's not the only thing you need to do when you're... Uh, you do make uh, those, um, like, exterior boxes, too, so... They could get in there before they get into your garage too. But. That's true. That's true. Uh, let's see. WB writes in regards to getting the air out of the cooling system. Elevate your front end a few inch, a uh, few inches. Air likes to rise and then burp the upper radiator hose. Um, okay. Yeah, and I, I've done that before. We yeah, squeeze so the upper radiator hose and there. get it to. Uh, Get it to try to get some of the air out of it if you get air trapped in there and I, i've done that too where you elevate the front end i uh, although i tend to get really aggressive and elevate it like you know a couple feet and then it uh, jack it up and then you know hopefully get the air there's some engines i know that can be a real bugger for trapping air in them uh, you know up in the head cavities and everything else where i see you leave the um, thermostat out also okay I haven't done it, but I know people have drilled a little hole in the first step, right. just a little weep hole, so it can. Yeah, some of them come with them, but not the older car. Yeah, actually, a lot of racers used to talk about yeah. you know uh, drilling the eighth inch hole mm -hmm. in, uh, in the thermostat, to, so there was you know there'd always be a way for the air or steam to escape uh, and not build up behind the thermostat if it did get you know steam yeah. pressurized. Um, okay, I've got a question here from uh, 
Remember who read Joe it is? He writes uh, in the video, in the video on the site, cast aluminum parts, you use Zep brand cleaner. Uh, when I went to buy it, it's specifically, it's specific not to use on aluminum. Can you clarify, please? I have the wrong type of Zep, or is it okay to use it on intakes? I'm cleaning up two aluminum intake. Uh, and it's in, uh, let's see, in the video shows a bottle of cleaner. I do not know if it's approved for aluminum. Uh, the Zep cleaner, uh, and, and I know the video that you're talking about, and that's where Bob Wilson at uh, RJ Restorations is uh, cleaning up some uh, aluminum valve covers and cleaning up old aluminum so it looks like, you know, it can be a challenge. Uh, if you just blast it, it tends to look kind of milky uh, and and doesn't look right. And that's why Bob usually does what he does is he does a blasting, but then he soaks it in the Zep machine cleaner. And the Zep he buys at like Home Depot or something like that. And it's a machine cleaner degreaser. Yes, it's not approved for aluminum. You shouldn't soak your valve covers in it overnight. You might be surprised what's left, and you don't want to ruin a whole set of valve covers or your new intake or anything. But it will, uh, it, you know, if you leave it in there for like you know five ten minutes, it will etch it enough and help smooth out. So it, it it what it does is it can gives it that natural aluminum look without looking like it's freshly beat blasted or sand blasted because that tends to look really fakey. Um, but it, it gives it that sort of factory aluminum look. So yes, it's not necessarily good for aluminum, but you're only going to have it in there five, 10 minutes. It's just going to etch the surface of it a little bit. You're going to wash it and clean it off. And, uh, it does a really good job. And Bob, you know, Bob built yeah, 300,000, $350,000 Boss 429 Mustang, where he's using these kind of products all the time on intakes that cost thousands of dollars um and i know bob wouldn't do something that wouldn't you know that wouldn't that would compromise that and uh yeah and his stuff is you know concourse condition and correct stuff so i you know i'm, I'm inclined to where the manufacturer says it's not good for aluminum i believe that i believe if you soak things in it for excessively long times you're probably going to have issues but that's not what you're doing it's not the way you're using it so i've used some uh i forget what it what brand it is but the pace you ever seen the pace oh no i haven't used the aluminum i just put it on a rag and it's oh yeah that to polish it to polish but it. this is like the cleanup just like clean the whole yeah. thing but yeah it, it uh if if you want if you watch the video bob's got it out there on, on on restoring valve covers aluminum valve covers and it really works. It you know having having watched him do it in person, I can say it's pretty cool. So you know, check out the video. Make sure you know, like I say, don't like you know use that product and soak them in it overnight. You're probably going to run into trouble. That's not what Bob actually instructs you to do in the video, uh, but uh, it yeah, he does have great results with it. He also uses that same degreaser to clean up old wiring harnesses. When he strips a harness out of a car, Bob is not a big one to replace a harness. He says, most cases, wiring and stuff like that will survive years. Uh, he says, you know, you want to inspect it closely, but you also want to clean it. And Bob doesn't want to, you know, get rid of any of the factory markings on the wires. He wants to maintain all the factory look. He just wants all the connectors clean. And he wants the wires clean of all the debris and grease and everything that's under. So he'll take an entire uh, harness and put it in like a plastic bin and use the same degreaser mixed like 50-50 and leave it in there, you know, for a couple hours. And it comes out and it's like you look at the harness and it looks like new and all the, the little brass connections on it and everything else. And you go, holy smokes, these look all like new. And it's like... Uh, you know, it's those kind of details. And actually, I think we even demonstrate that in one of the videos where Bob's detailing some stuff out where he, he's actually, you know, we actually soaked the harness for a few hours and, and cleaned it all up. It was like the difference it made. The wires were all suddenly bright in color. Then all the markings were still on them and everything looked like new. And it was like, 
Yeah, it was like, why would you want to replace that with you know mm-hmm. something new if you have if the the original is good and it can be cleaned up? You know, it makes more sense to keep that than to replace it. Terry would like that keeping the original stuff. Yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, there must be some form of mild acid in that. Yeah, there. I think so. I think you know, it's uh, it's enough of an acid where it's going to. Uh, you know, clean, but mm-hmm. you know, you probably don't want to leave stuff in it for extended and periods. And that's most likely why they say not to use it. With they, they, it's usually overboard on any warning like that. Because yeah. I mean, it's surprising they have to put in there. Don't drink it. You know, it's because somebody <laughs> did something stupid, and so it's, they're just covering their self, themselves. I'm sure. Yeah. Okay, we have a fellow member who writes in. Uh, I have a 1977 Trans Am 403 and unfortunately need to manually bleed my brakes. I bought the car a few months ago and I have to replace the calipers on the front. Any advice, suggestion, information would greatly appreciate it. Um, I don't know. They, uh, we have a few videos on the site on bleeding your brakes. Uh, check those out. Um, you know, the, as far as I'm, you know, not aware of any special needs uh, in no, bleeding sure. the front brakes on a Trans Am. Yeah, I guess if uh, he's just 70, replacing calipers. Yeah, seventy-seven. You shouldn't uh, have to bleed the master cylinder or anything. So yeah, he's just replacing calipers. Didn't and, say if you had a mullet, did it? <laughs> Yeah, Terry. Terry's brother. Terry's brother has a Trans Am. <laughs> He's got the late seventies mullet to go along with it. It's right in the car. Uh, let's see. We have uh, Lynn asks. Uh, oh, is a pusher fan on a radiator effective? Uh, so, in other words, on the front of on the front of the radiator, pushing back as opposed to pulling the air through. Uh, I know a lot of street riders do it um, on cars where, where they, yeah, and cars with short engine compartments and, you know, if you got a grill out in front, you got a little bit of space in there to get it in. Um, it's not ideal. I don't think it's ideal because you can't, there's no way to, uh, yeah, there's no are. way to properly shroud right. it so you get right. good cooling. And if you don't have a big enough one you're taking away all the cooling of the radiator that if you put a shroud on it yeah you know. and so i you know my recommendation is is to go put it behind it and you know i know sometimes you know the front uh, even on my 35 chevy uh the the front of the water pump even with a short uh, short water pump on it and it's back and everything else it's still really close to the front of the water the front of the water pump pulley is really close to the radiator but uh by running a shroud and two fans that are above and below it uh i can get cooling through the whole radiator uh it's open and still have you know still uh be open in the front so i'm not push i'm not pushing the air a pusher will work it depends on the car how hot it runs and how tight the engine compartment is and everything else so i'm not going to i'm not going to emphatically say no a pusher won't work because a pusher will work on some cars it's not ideal it's not the best because you can't yeah. get good flow out from Especially that on the highway um yeah, because you know, basically over thirty-five miles an hour, your fan's not doing anything, anyways, and then your 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 fan up in front of the radiator becomes actually a blockage for air going through, so it's pushing it away from cooling that area of the uh, radiator. So, my recommendation would be, you know, always pull. You know, if it's you know, a last resort, and if your car engine is not like really super high performance, so you're running really hot, uh, you know, you could you could get away with it. You know, uh, know your car and everything else, and hope for the best. But 
you know, uh, I think if you're pushing, you can run into trouble easy enough. Just be prepared if it is running hot that you're ready to try to figure some other solution out for the problem. The uh, we have a member that Jim uh, Bill who writes in. He has a 1967 Mustang 289 with an Edelbrock four barrel carb. Oh, you thought it was somebody we knew, huh? Uh, it has a manual choke. It starts immediately when the engine is cold. If I pull the choke out and press the accelerator while turning the key, so if he pulls the choke out, press the accelerator while turning the key, it'll start immediately. It also starts easily right after I turn it off the engine at operating temperature. So if he shuts it off and he turns it right back on again, it'll fire right up. However, if he leaves it for more than a few minutes, it has to turn over several times before it catches and something stalls again before, it re and then sometimes stalls again before it really gets going. So it has a little trouble getting started. If it stalled, oh, he got it started, but then it would stall again, okay. I can sometimes smell gas at this point. Any ideas on possible solutions to the problem? How hot is it running? Yeah, yeah. I've um, seen it paper lock. Boil it up. You'd be smelling it. May start, and then all of a sudden your vapor locks. It, yeah, and it, yeah. Be, he says it starts sometimes, but then it. Uh, it says it cranks for a while, so it sounds like it'll, it'll stall. Yeah, so it, 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 it sounds. Yeah, it sounds to me like, and it might be if you put a spacer under the carb, yeah, to you know keep the heat yeah. up. You, you know, uh, they they have the the non heat conducting material, and now I'm gonna forget what it's called, or if I'm gonna call it the wrong name. Uh, but it, it, they're little spacers that uh, you can, you know, That's usually like plates. half inch or they're not aluminum, but they're like a plastic yeah. composite that, that prevents the, the carb from absorbing the heat from the intake and the engine. Um, that might, that might, you know, uh, uh, that might tell you, I think it's a phenolic, phenolic carb spacer is what they call it. And, uh, if you can get one of those in there, that might help. Might uh, it, it? You know, it'd be something I'd try just to make sure that's not the problem, it could, because that's what it sounds like to me. It's like yeah. um, if the car if the car starts fine when it's cold, or you, the instant restart. Of course, the carb hasn't so absorbed any heat from the engine at, at that point because you know the carb when it was running had air coming through and cooling it all the time. But as soon as you're, you got a hot engine and it's just sitting there for a while, it's going to heat up the carb and yeah. give you issues with the restart at that point. But that would be my initial guess on that. Especially if you've got a cast iron intake. Yeah. Yeah. Because it'll hold it'll, the heat a lot longer. It'll, it'll hold the heat longer. And, uh, but even even an aluminum one will transfer. It'll transfer. Heat. They'll, they'll get hot, too. It'll cool off a lot quicker. So that's, that's our initial thought on that. You know, it's again, it you know, for for the cost of a, a carb spacer, it would be yeah, money well spent. Uh, just try it. You know, mm -hmm. get some longer carb studs, throw it on, see if that solves the problem. If it does, you know, you got by cheap and uh, solved the issue all at once. The uh, and you know, those kinds of things can can crop up all the time. Okay, guys, you know, I'm um, looking at the clock, and believe it or not, we got to <laughs> the top of the hour. Where'd the hour go again, guys? Uh, appreciate everybody for coming out. Again, down below here is the 66 tips, the uh, uh, restoration tips brochure I put together. Go ahead and uh, click on that, download that. It's free. Uh, hopefully, you can find something in there that, you know, you can use in your shop. Uh, also, if you were one of the winners, the four winners that I've mentioned earlier in the virtual car show, you know, check your email boxes. We send out email notices so we can get like uh, your uh, ad mailing address so we can send you, you know, the great uh, wizards cool kits that we are uh, 
that they supported us with. Thanks, Wizards, for uh, supporting you know supporting our virtual car show. Hope to do another one soon. It's a great great little uh, kit with close to a hundred dollars worth of products in it. So it's like it's a it was a it was a cool thing to to bet you guys are eligible. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's the way it should be. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh I want my cool kit. Uh, and let's see. I think I covered everything. You guys got anything you want to add? No. All right. No. Well, thanks, guys, for coming out tonight. Uh, appreciate it. And we'll see you again next month.